Okay. All right. Hi, David. Um, thank you so much for doing this. Um, today's interview uh, is going to be with Dr. David Healy. Um, he has done so much in his career that it's kind of hard for me to, to, to sum it up. You know, he's an expert in psychopharmacology. He's spent a lot of time looking at the risks of psychiatric um, medications. Uh, he's been involved in, in several uh, litigations for the harms of psychiatric medications. And he practices in a lot of conventional psychiatric settings. So the overarching theme of this uh, interview is to talk to David about um, his view on psychiatric medications, mostly going to focus on antidepressants and, um, and how it uh, has influenced his way of practicing. So um, I may turn it over. I'm going to turn it over to you now, David, just so you can say a little bit about yourself and uh, introduce yourself. Okay, Joseph, thanks. And it's good to be here. And um... I'm not exactly sure what to say to um, introduce myself, um, except I happened to, uh, to get lucky, which was I was working on serotonin reuptake before the SSRIs came in the market. And this meant that uh, the pharmaceutical companies uh, thought I'd be a good people, or a good person to help explain the effects of these drugs to other doctors. And they sort of hired me. Uh, I actually became a consultant. I gave talks to them. I chaired symposia for the industry. And uh, this meant that I got to see how things work, but I also got to see uh, what people in industry were saying behind the scenes. Things like, uh, you know, these SSRIs are really quite weak. They're not as good as the older antidepressants in terms of getting people who are severely depressed well. But the marketing department tells us that we can still make a lot of money out of them. So, you know, this mm -hmm. colored the way I've viewed these pills um, ever since. And you've not just focused on, um, on I guess, the adverse, uh, I guess, um, behavioral side effects, which I think is probably what you're most commonly known for, which is antidepressants and suicide risk. You know, in recent years, you've talked a lot about... Um, post SSRI sexual dysfunction. Um, you run a, a, you know, a really great blog, you know, the davidhealy.org blog, but also the risk blog as well, which we'll link in the description of this video. Will you talk about a whole range of problems with psychiatric medications? I mean, you talk, you've talked about post acute withdrawal, people having challenges coming off antidepressants, as well as um, um, people having a lot of problems coming off benzodiazepines as well. And so I guess, you know, I think I think a good place to start, you know, is to to kind of focus on the uh, on antidepressants because I know a lot of people that may watch this, you know, they have a lot of questions about their medications, their antidepressants. They may have been harmed by them. So, I want to kick it off by asking you, wh what do you consider to be the most troublesome uh, side effects of antidepressants? Well, I guess part of the problem begins right at the start before you have a pill. Okay, which is the SSRIs and other drugs get approved by FDA as antidepressants. And the problem with that is doctors figure, well, this is an antidepressant. You're depressed, so I just need to give you this pill. They don't ask the question, what do I want to do to get this person well? And in mm -hmm. fact, we know we've got a group of drugs like the SSRIs, which work on the serotonin system. We've got norepinephrine reuptake uh, uh, inhibitors, which don't work in the serotonin system. We've got a bunch of drugs, which then can increase your appetite and uh, increase your, your uh, ability to sleep or just knock you out completely so uh, 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 you sleep for ages. And then we've got the older drugs, the tricyclic antidepressants, which treat people who've got a condition called melancholia and mm -hmm. it's this is a very uh, severe mood disorder where people are at high risk of going on to commit suicide the ssris know about that's been done where the tcas are compared with the ssris for severe mood disorder you find that uh, the tcas beat the ssris but let me go back the average doctor just reaches for an antidepressant without asking the question, what do I want to do to get this person well? And we know in the case of the SSRIs, what this means is that roughly half the people who go on their first SSRI stop it within a month. 
you know, uh, because it's clearly not suiting them. If the doctor had asked uh, the question, or uh, yes, had been thinking and said, look, this is an anxious person, maybe they're uh, uh, depressed also, SSRIs are more anxiolytic. Mm -hmm. uh, when they came in the market first, the companies were in two minds about whether uh, to call them anxiolytics or antidepressants. Didn't if know they were that. called yeah. mm. anxiolytics, people uh, would have a clear idea, look, this is an anxious person and uh, I need a drug that's going to reduce the anxiety. And the commonest clinically useful thing these drugs do is they emotionally numb you. It's not quite the same kind of anxiolysis that you get with uh, the benzodiazepines or the antipsychotics or other drugs, but it is a distinct form of anxiolysis where, for instance, uh, you know, let's say I've got a touch of OCD and I wander down the stairs and the kids have thrown their shoes all over the place. And I like the shoes to be neat at the end of uh, mm -hmm. uh, at the stairs. And I get anxious when I say, or um, I get angry maybe when I see the shoes all over the place. If I'm on an SSRI, I'll sail past these shoes and not be bothered. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, this is um, an effect that comes on very, very quickly. I mean, the usual thing you hear about these drugs is that they take weeks to work. In actual fact, within maybe 24 to 48 hours, I've been on one of these drugs. People will, if, if the effect suits them, people will feel chilled out. So much so that anyone who knows these drugs well, like the patients in hospital who might be on them themselves, looking at a doctor who's part of a clinical trial, a healthy volunteer trial, seeing what these drugs do, is able to spot without being told this guy's on something. It's mm -hmm. a very obvious effect. Now, the obvious effect can be a good or a bad thing. Okay, it may be something that you say, well, yes, I feel numbed out, uh, and this helps me, this actually works for me. Or you may say, I feel much too numbed out, <laughs> okay? Or mm -hmm. you may say, yeah, I feel numbed out, but this isn't the kind of thing that's actually going to help me. Um, you can get weird kind of situations where people start contemplating doing things that they wouldn't normally do from homicide to burglary to arguments to leaving their partner, all kinds of things, partly because they don't feel the anxiety that you and I would normally feel uh, when we think about these things. Okay, so you're able mm -hmm. to do things that you might not otherwise do, which you'll later when you come off the pills might bitterly regret this is so this i was going to say that i I'll, I'll i'll interrupt there for a second just because there are so many threads which i want to pull on there you know coming back to the start of it and i think what you were mentioning is the drugs are prescribed um without concern to the actual therapeutic effect that people are looking for you know this type of mood constriction which can be therapeutic they're kind of at least what i think you're saying and at least what i see a lot of the time is they really are prescribed as if they are antidepressants. You know, they are used to treat, you know, a kind of, a, uh, you know, this clear condition where you have depression. And if we just, you know, lift up your serotonin a little bit, whatever kind of symptoms you're having, they are going to resolve because we're treating your underlying condition. And so the kind of problems that you can get into when, when that is happening is you don't really know what you're looking for. And then you can miss a lot of things. And I think that was where you were going, where you were talking about, you know, there's this therapeutic effect where, you know, there's this mood constriction, which could be helpful for someone like with severe OCD or maybe severe anxiety, you know, really, really high. But doctors are going to miss a lot of the times where maybe you overshoot the effect and now you're overly blunted. It's having a negative effect on your life. Or maybe even you're having one of these paradoxical reactions where, um, you become disinhib disinhibited, you become aggressive or, you know, develop something like akathisia, you know? Um, so that's kind of, um, uh, yeah, I wonder if you could kind of sp speak, speak to that a little bit, talking mm -hmm. about, you know, the, the consequences of, um, I guess, physicians not really, I guess, psychiatrists not being really, um, I guess that they're not asking a lot of questions about the, you know, the drug effect, how it's making someone feel and, and then how you see that 
cause problems. And I know you've been in a lot of lawsuits and things like that. So I think that's, it's a really great question to ask someone like you, because you have seen it all, you know, let, mm-hmm. let's talk about how things go wrong when people aren't looking for the drug effect and monitoring for it. Yeah. Well, just go back. You see, when FDA licensed these drugs, they licensed them on the basis that there's been a small drop in the Hamilton rating scale for depression. And once they see that, they say, yes, you can use the word antidepressant. But FDA aren't looking at, and companies don't look at either, what is it that this drug is doing to get people well? So doctors are have a bunch of antidepressants they can hand out, and they pick them off the shelf and hand them out without thinking, what is that I want to do to get the person well? And as I've said, drugs acting on the serotonin system do a very distinctive thing that companies don't want you to think about. And FDA aren't in the aren't really in uh, the business of trying to get people to think about these things. They assume doctors are just going to be aware of this anyway. They're going to notice what happens to the patient right in front of them, but we don't. And leading on from the emotional numbing thing, the single commonest thing any of these SSRI drugs do is to genitally numb people. Within 30 minutes of your first pill, people will be to some degree genitally numb. A small number will be genitally irritable, but for the most part, it's going to be genital numbness. And the extraordinary thing is the clinical trials of these drugs didn't pick that up at all. Doctors don't ask the question uh, at all. And it looks like the genital numbness and the emotional numbness go hand in hand. Uh, We aren't sure if they're absolutely the same thing. It looks to me like more people become genitally gently numb than emotionally numb, but there's a huge overlap here. And this is of interest because one of the things that can happen to people when they become, well, first of all, if you become genitally numb, well, for some people, this can be a good thing. For men who've got a premature ejaculation problem, this can be mm-hmm. a good thing. But for the most part, it's going to get in the way of you've been able to make love the way you would normally. Mm-hmm. Now, you're told that, well, yes, sure, this happens, uh, but it's all going to clear up once you halt the drug. And it's very clear now that it's not something that necessarily clears up when you halt the drug. The problem, paradoxically, can become much worse. Rather than going back to the way you were beforehand, you can become even more profoundly genitally numb, uh, and that can last for decades. People... Uh, uh, commit suicide when they find that, uh, hey, look, I'm just not able to make love uh, at all anymore. And they also commit suicide when they go to doctors and find out that the doctor laughs at them, saying things like, you know, how can a drug that's out of your body for months be causing a problem like this? And what, uh, you know, uh, 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 the person who has been on the pills, it could be me, it could be you, realizes then is, well, it isn't just that this guy's laughing at me, it's no one knows a thing about this problem and no one's doing any research about it. It's a bit like, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical companies, well, not uh, the pharmaceutical companies, the, the, the tobacco companies, you know, they don't do any research on whether uh, kind of smoking can cause you to get a heart attack or get lung cancer, because that would be to acknowledge the problem that their product causes. In the mm-hmm. same way, uh, you can't really depend on uh, the pharmaceutical companies to do any research on this. And if doctors in general aren't aware of the problem, they aren't going to do any research either. So, you know, at the situation of people of who, whom there are thousands who have this kind of problem, uh, you know, the situation that they're in is pretty grim. Mm-hmm. And the other thing, this links into a further issue, which is withdrawal from these pills. Um, If you're on SSRIs or other antidepressants, you know, when you come to halt them, you can have problems. And uh, the problems can be reasonably severe and can, uh, but will usually clear up within a few weeks, except for a group of people. We don't know how large this group is, which is, as I've said, part of the withdrawal issues seems to be that the drugs can cause problems that persist for months or years afterwards. And even if you taper the drug that you've been on extremely slowly, 
it isn't the case that you're not going to have problems. You will have problems. So we don't know how large the group is that has persistent problems, but it's certainly not small. And this is uh, this is a great worry. I mean, not 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 small to the extent that there are now online support groups in the tens of thousands of of people who are going on there who are um, essentially uh, depending on each other to for emotional strength as they go through this. It's a huge issue, and it's come up more and more um, in social media over the last few years. And it's um, although not with the antidepressants, but at least with the benzodiazepines, there's there's finally some mainstream recognition with labeling uh, for these drugs. Um, and, um, you know, I, th I think something that I'm really curious about, um, and because it's something I've personally struggled with as a psychiatrist, it's so you know that these drugs can cause, uh, well, let's talk about uh, the antidepressants and withdrawal. Um, for me, there's no other way to say this because I, I treat these patients. They can be neurologically devastating when people come off them, you know, pain, severe anxiety, um, which lasts for months to years. Uh, with the PSSD, like you said, you know, they it totally impairs their relationships, but also there seems to be this, this, these, these, these cognitive problems, these severe cognitive problems which go along with it, and this blunting which really renders people um, incapable of working or, you know, really carrying on with their life. The, the problem with these two side effects in particular is um, they're not predictable. I mean, there's no risk factor where I could reliably say to someone, Hey, if I started you on this medication, you know, you're at a higher risk or you're at a lower risk. There's no real way I know of um, where I could say, Oh, this is like an early sign of this, and uh, and it's highly predictive that you're going to go on to develop this problem. So we're going to stop it now, and you'll be okay. And so, in a sense, it's um, you know, to have someone on one of these medications long term for me, now I'm always worried about making people worse. And I feel like, at least for me, I've arrived at a place where I only really feel comfortable using the SSRIs in people who have the most severe depression and anxiety I've, I've seen where, you know, even if one of these things were to happen, um, maybe it's, it's, it's still better than where they initially were when they started. And, and I was glad you brought up OCD initially because that tends to be one of the conditions where I think they're actually okay because I've seen really severe debilitating cases of OCD um, before. So I think, Severe OCD makes sense for me um, in terms of using antidepressants, but yeah, I, I want to turn it over to you. you know, so you, you're not your deep knowledge of all of these things. What are the patients where you where you start these medications on? Still, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, just a few quick things uh, as you were yeah. going through that, Joe. One is um, the fact that. Uh, I think over a period of time, uh, over the last 30 years or so, I've seen a shift when patients go on SSRIs. Um, if the pills don't suit them, either they stop them or the doctor halts them reasonably quickly. But again and again, more often uh, these days, one of the things I see, and this, um, this actually happens to children uh, also when they're put on these drugs, is that, uh, you know, they get put on a 20 milligram dose of an SSRI, they come back to the doctor a few weeks later and say they're worse. And the response is to increase the dose. Mm -hmm. And after they come back again and say they're worse, again, the response will be to increase the dose, or perhaps change them from one SSRI to a different SSRI. And mm -hmm. um, that's, I mean, what we've got is company views that our pills can't cause problems. If you're having problems, it's the illness that's causing them. And of course, if it's the illness, the correct response is to double the dose. However, if it's the pill that's causing the problem, this is exactly the wrong thing to be doing. Mm -hmm. And I think, generally speaking, my sense is, I mean, it's very hard to quantify this, but my sense is that... Um, you know, that we've shifted from thinking we're using risky things uh, and we need uh, to be cautious about using them to thinking that these things can only do good. They're antidepressant, you know. So if the person appears to be more suicidal, say, which is 
part and parcel of being depressed. Well, the answer is to give more pills. Let me like that, let me bring what out. They say, they say you know it's like insulin for diabetes is what I used to hear a lot of where it's yeah acting on this clear underlying abnormality when it's really not. You know, there's no I guess serotonin deficit, you know, reliably found in depressed patients. So mm. they make it sound like it's this very highly targeted treatment. And if you just fix it, all the downstream effects are going to clear up, but that's not what it is. Yeah. No, that's not what it is. It's um, talking to Arva Carlson, who won a Nobel Prize and was the person who created the first SSRI. He was awfully clear that what he was doing when they made the first SSRI was to introduce a therapeutic principle. There was no idea there. I mean, at that point, the idea that there was a problem with the serotonin system in people who were depressed didn't register. It, it had been talked about, but it had been thrown out as clearly not right. What he was doing was to say, look, we've got these older drugs and they work on the norepinephrine system and they work in the serotonin system. Let's tease out a drug that just works on the serotonin system without working on the norepinephrine system and see what that does. See what the therapeutic principle is. You know, what is it that the drug is doing that can be helpful? But let me take you back, because again, you mentioned OCD. And let me give you what I think is a, a very interesting angle on the whole thing, which is many years ago, I had an extraordinarily nice man. He was uh, a guy who works on heating systems. So he was a workman, no kind of background in healthcare mm -hmm. or things like that. And he had bad OCD. And if you're working on heating systems and having to plug the right wire into the right place and the right this into the right that or whatever, you know, if you've got OCD, this can be pretty crippling. And his OCD had got worse and he came to me for help and we used some SSRIs and we used some antipsychotics. We used the usual things that people would mm -hmm. use. And we were getting nowhere. He was getting worse, in fact. Okay, So after a few months, he came back to me. And uh, it was clear that he had something to tell me, but he was a little cautious about telling me. The good news was that he was better now. He'd solved the problem. I hadn't. He had. Okay, And he'd solved the problem by resuming smoking. Now, he'd done more than that which is he'd gone on the internet and checked this out. And there are control trials showing nicotine is good for OCD. It's just as good as SSRIs can be. Chances are, if I'm treating your OCD or whatever, an SSRI might suit you, or nicotine might suit you. It's probably not the case that they both suit you, that you're going to be a person who's going to respond to one therapeutic principle or a different one, which is nicotine. But the point I'm trying to bring out here is everybody everybody will be awfully comfortable with the idea uh, of saying the art of medicine is bringing good out of the use of a poison if we give them the example of treating OCD with nicotine. They'd say, well, that is a poison. We all agree that's a poison, and you mm -hmm. probably shouldn't be on it for the rest of your life. Well, SSRIs and other antidepressants are on prescription because we've every reason to believe that they are more dangerous than alcohol and nicotine, which are over the counter. You know, we should be letting people know, look, this is a risky thing we're doing. And it's probably not the case that you should be on this for the rest of your life. It's, you know, we don't quite know how it's going to kill you if you're on it for decades and decades. Chances are, though, you're going to die earlier if you're on a group of pills more than you need to be on for years and years and years. So we do, I mean, the problem we've got is that's just not part of the therapeutic culture these days. It's awfully difficult to lay these things um, on the table for people. They want a drug that's going to cure them and let them get on with life and everything's going to be fine. We've got a bunch of drugs that can be very helpful in the short term, terribly tricky, if it turns out they're drugs you can't get off easily and you're on them years and years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, again, the theme, the theme that seems to be coming through with a lot of this that, that I see a lot of is, yeah, the whole idea of marketing these things as specific treatment, you know, cures. Uh, you know, all of these people out here in the population, they have depression. It's more or less the same disease entity. If we just use it, 
it's it's fine don't don't think about it because if you start to think about it in a very discriminating way you know who are the patients in this cohort which would benefit from this mood constricting effect um and then you start to think downstream okay maybe this is mood constricting effect will help hit my patient when he's you know working on the wires because he's an hvaac technician but what effect is it going to have with him and his children what effect is it going to have with his wife when you start looking at it through that lens of how we how is this general mood constriction going to play out in all the domains that are important for this gentleman it becomes a whole lot more complicated and actually more interesting as a psychiatrist i like to think but that's it's it's probably not really great for drug companies because once you have more of this discernment and more of this discrimination people start using the treatments a lot more selectively and uh i don't think people really you know at least there's the commercial side of selling med- drugs where you where that that's not really helpful you know it's better to think of it as as this as the same thing but i, I don't i don't want to let you off because initially i had asked you um about um where you use antidepressants uh these days and i i don't want to come back to it because it's something that i struggle with so i wanted to to get your download on the types of patients where you think hey maybe i'm going to initiate this treatment on it knowing what you know now yeah and the problem joseph is that you know the the pharmaceutical industry has made more than a hundred billion dollars over the last Mm -hmm. few decades on these pills and you and i still don't know what the right pill is to give to the person who walks in the door it's really by chance that we're going to get the yes. right pill so there's no i mean you know i mean this is this is actually a real scandal okay mm-hmm. um so if i'm going to give exercise a little bit will be will hinge on asking the person uh, if they've had one before and what the outcome was a little bit will hinge on if i mean if it's actually you know, the first time that they've been on them a bit will hinge on whether there's anyone else in the family who's had them and what the outcome was because these things tend to run in families if you respond to an ssri chances are those closely related to you possibly will also okay mm-hmm. and if you haven't chances are if they haven't chances are you won't also so there's that but my job nowadays often is um, not actually beginning people on treatment the role often is people are referred to me they've been on ssris for 10 or 20 years since their teenage years and uh you know they aren't working anymore they've kind of pooped out and uh, the doctor refers them to me wondering what we can do maybe uh, uh, uh the doctor has added in one or two other pills and these haven't really worked out you know you're told these days that if you're on an SSRI and it's not working, just to add a, a Bilify or Rexulti uh, to it. And this yeah. can be a disaster, okay? Yeah. So uh, the patient gets referred to me. And my job is really to diffuse the bomb. Uh, you know, these things aren't easily done. Um, you know, trying to work out, I mean, there will be people, uh, uh, as I said, where we can reduce the dose reasonably slowly and get them off it and then start thinking, do they need pills? One of the things that has got lost in the mix here is when the SSRIs came in the market first, there was a good deal of work being done on what was called primary care in the UK, the nervous problems people had in primary care that brought them along to a doctor, uh, where they were given or had been given benzodiazepines during the 1980s and were been given SSRIs during the 1990s. And invariably, this work showed that there's a large number of people who will get well without treatment, that the conditions they've got are self-limiting. Now, maybe the OCD isn't, but even even with OCD, if you have OCD and it can seem to have been there for years, if you check with people, they have their ups and downs. They have their times when it's worse, or they have their times when it isn't as bad. So one of the things we don't say to people is, look, you know, uh, you have a condition for, uh, 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 at the most part, may be bad now but it isn't going to last it's going to clear up probably within a few weeks whether we put you on pills or not and i'm happy to see you maybe weekly or whatever or see you more urgently if things get worse and we have pills in reserve which we can use which will help if things get worse but all things been equal if you your problem clears up 
without us giving you pills, you're going to be more resilient uh, in the future. You're not going to think of yourself as a person who needs pills. You're going to think of yourself as a person who's got a current condition, but you've been here before and it cleared up before and it's likely to clear up again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's, there's definitely a lot that can be said about um, telling people, you know, you, you have a mental illness, you know, you have major depressive disorder, this is serious, you know, uh, you, know you need treatment. And I, I think that, you know, that com it comes from a place of trying to be compassionate, you know, we, we don't want to be stigmatizing, we want to give you the, um, the concessions that someone needs who is really suffering and who has a genuine illness. But the downside of that is that people don't end up, um, I guess, feeling like it's something they can overcome in a way. I mean, it, it's less of a narrative about um, um, this is something you can overcome. You know, if you, if, if you work on your relationships, if you work on improving your environment and maybe, maybe you have some past trauma that you need to work through and understand how it's leading into your life and affecting your relationships. I mean, when you look at it just as like an illness, as opposed to what are the upstream effects that led to me being absolutely exhausted, feeling hopeless and having all of those symptoms of depression. Um, obviously when you conceptualize it from, you know, this is this, I mean, obviously it may be coming from genetics, but for the vast majority of people, it's circumstantial, at least from what I can see. And then when you look at it in that way, um, you can get very creative. Um, you can work with a professional about, you know, fixing those things and like you said, you will come out of it um, almost transformed because you've gone through that journey of actually identifying the different things that were leading you to be overwhelmed with anxiety to the point where you've fallen into a depression. Um, and so that is, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting about how a label can can have these downstream consequences. Um, and I guess I wanted to ask you about this as well. I mean, do, do you feel like um, there could be a negative side effect of being on, uh, I guess, being on the antidepressants from the perspective of um, almost it dampens your um, the, the amount that you're bothered about things, right? You know, if 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 the, if there are genuine things that bother you and you're on something that makes you just go, oh well, don't really care about it now. It's almost like an opportunity cost in a way, you know, maybe these are signals telling you you need to address things. But if you're, if you're in this state, you know, they could just fester. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, that's something that I've, I've thought about. I, I don't know if that strikes you the same way. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah. There's a few different things um, that I can say about that. And mm -hmm. let's see if I can recall them all. Um, yeah. When the issue about getting hooked to antidepressants comes up and people having problems trying to withdraw from them, invariably there are people who get in touch with uh, the newspaper or the TV show, whatever it is that talked about these things and said, says, my antidepressant has saved my life. And, <laughs> uh, you know, that's fair enough. Uh, but it likely for a bunch of people comes from the fact that when they try to reduce the dose, they feel terrible. And they say, and when they put the dose back up, they feel better again, okay? So they're misinterpreting, uh, at least um, there's a proportion of people who are misinterpreting what they're reading as an illness coming back, when in actual fact, it's withdrawal from the pills. And the pill that they're on has now, in a sense, become the illness that they have. And it can be mm -hmm. awfully hard getting off it. You know, this can lead to you, uh, you know, actually becoming suicidal. One of the reasons why people perhaps don't get as worked up about it as sometimes either you or I might think they should is because, of course, if these pills are also emotionally numbing them, well, I'm on these pills. What's the problem? They're not bothered about a thing that they ought to be bothered about. Mm -hmm. One of the other things you find is that they're, partner may recognize that this pill is numbing them. They're more mellow than they would be if they weren't on the pill. And their partner may be keen for them not to stop the pill. The partner may be may be awfully comfortable having a husband uh, or a wife who's just mellowed out and not bothering them. Okay. I'm, ima I'm imagining a husband who's who's very happy with the nagging coming down, you know. But then on the other hand, I'm imagining a wife who could be 
very upset if the husband was on the medication and isn't concerned about the things that she's saying anymore. You know, there's... Well, it isn't that. No, the one yeah. uh, I'm thinking yeah. about is more, um, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, the scene that came to mind for me was actually the wife who was um, uh, concerned about her husband being more uh, uh, assertive uh, if he was off these pills and not, mm -hmm. uh, as you say, doing um, what she mm -hmm. maybe thinks he ought to be doing. But uh, anyway, yeah. So um, there's that effect. Um, now, I was going to go on and say something else. Uh, which, um, yeah, I mean, one of the, a little bit of the problem I think we've got as well is, and, and this comes through with children more than others, where increasingly, you know, if you, if you had a teenager come to you 10 or 15 years ago, you know, uh, the, the, um, the idea that they might take an SSRI, uh, wouldn't have looked like a really good idea. You'd say to them, look, you're in your teenage years. This is a time when we're all confused. Uh, and it's a good thing to be confused. You have to grapple with these things uh, in order to work out your own path through life. But if all the other teens at school are on these pills and saying, I can think more clearly when I'm on them. And if your parents are on them as well, the idea of trying to say to a teenager that the pills you're mother is on and she's quite happy with our father's on and he's quite happy with aren't necessarily a good idea for you is harder to sell you know because uh you know, the parents are going to resist the idea they i mean what's good for me uh is good for my teenage son or daughter in fact they may be the one that refers or says that it's a good idea for the daughter our son to go along and see if a pill would help. Okay, so- Yeah, it works for me, you know, right? Why, yeah, why not yeah. for them? Yeah. Sure. There's, we're in an extraordinary situation though, which is, um, you know, um, for instance, if you change the scene a bit and look at acne, mm -hmm. 10 or 20 years ago, there was a whole load of self-help things people did for acne before going near pills. And if they did go along to a, dermatologist uh you know there was a whole load of pills that they could take that were relatively mild not all harmless uh but now the chances are if you've got acne even relatively minor acne and uh, even if you don't go to a dermatologist if you go to a family doctor you get prescribed isotretinoin now if you have a flu and i give you a cancer chemotherapy drug you and your family and everybody else who heard about it would freak. They'd say, good grief, you don't do this. You know, you've got to ensure that a drug that's dangerous like this is only used for conditions that are life-threatening. Well, isotretinoin is an anti-cancer drug. That's where it began. But we've lost our sensitivity for these things. And it too can cause people uh, to become suicidal. It can wipe out your ability to make love. It's not a harmless drug. There's lots of people that can have it. It's almost as though people with a flu can have cancer chemotherapy and without it actually causing problems. That's absolutely true. But we also know some people who get put on cancer chemotherapy for a flu are going to have pretty serious problems. And it's the same with most of the mental health drugs as well. These are very heavy duty drugs. Some people may go on them and have no problems. Others are going to have very significant problems. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's, that's very, um, that, I mean, in, in general, I feel like, um, you know, we've, we've gotten to a place where it is so easy to get started on medications where, um, I mean, a lot of the, the, the patients that I'll see, um, I think I've told, you know, I, I have a private practice, but I also work clinically in emergency rooms and uh, hospital units. So, you know, there's, there's so many of these patients who, who, who just get started on medications, um, you know, diagnosed with bipolar disorder, where maybe it's, it's just more of emotional ability linked to contextual factors or maybe previous trauma or something like that. That, that seems to be the most common 
and they come in loaded up, you know, antidepressant, mood stabilizer, antipsychotic, boost bar, you know, and so many of these things that they've just been started and continued, you know, for, for years. And you talk to them about it and, you know, they're having pretty bad side effects. You know, if they're on mood stabilizer, if they're on lithium, maybe they've had half of their, their parathyroid out because they've had a problem and, and they don't even know if it's helping them, you know, and it, uh, and so yeah. it's just this, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, Let me it, pick it, up on that point for yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is, um, FDA these days do a thing that they didn't used to do, okay? They say we've approved this drug, this SSRI or mood stabilizer or whatever, on the base of a favorable benefit-risk ratio. And because of that, a lot of doctors like you and me say, well, look, this drug is going to do more good than harm, and we give it. We don't think about the harms as much, we think about the good, and we don't want to put people off, uh, uh, you know, from the opportunity to get this good by mentioning harms. We don't, you know, we don't want to deter them from having treatment. But the trials that FDA look at are ones where, you know, the mood effect of the antidepressant may take six or eight weeks to show it's a very small effect, but FDA are prepared to license the drug on the basis of that. And they completely miss the fact that from the very first pill, you're going to be genitally numb and you may ultimately end up not being able to make love again forever. So I don't know how FDA can ever say that they know there's a positive benefit risk ratio. But what I do know is this. Mm -hmm. If you remember the guy that I talked to you who, uh, about who had gone back smoking for his OCD, mm -hmm. he's in a position to decide for him whether there's a positive benefit risk ratio here. And I think that's a very important point. It's really uh, you know, the patients in uh, the first instance, perhaps with our help, who are able to work it out. You know, is this going to suit me? Sometimes if they're numbed and all, they may say, yeah, no, I feel good. This is no problem. But you and I from the outside, or maybe their husband and wife from the outside can see, well, yeah, they seem to feel fine in this, but actually things aren't going right. There are serious problems happening. So, but it's it's us on the ground, you with the person in the room and the person themselves, and maybe the rest of uh, you, the family who can work out if there's a positive benefit risk ratio. There's mm -hmm. a great story. Um, that I can tell you about is yeah. this, this goes back to the beta blockers, which are used uh, for people who are anxious. Okay. But when they've been used for people who are hypertensive, there was a primary care doctor in the UK who did a little trial. He sort of took 75 patients and he figured he was going to give them a beta blocker for their mild hypertension. And in all cases, I think 74 of the cases, the blood pressure dropped. Now, we now know if you use beta blockers for people who've got mild hypertension, that you're not going to save their lives. I mean, you simply don't save their lives, okay? The blood pressure figures do drop, but it doesn't turn out to be meaningful, okay? But the doctor was awfully happy. And in most instances, uh, uh, the patient was too. But this doctor did an interesting thing. He checked with the patient's husband or wife. And in 74 of the 75 cases, the family member was unhappy because they could see the patient having a bunch of problems they hadn't had before. They had mild hypertension, it, no symptoms. Now from at the beta blocker, they were having tons of symptoms and they were neurotic. They were worried about their blood pressure in a way that they hadn't been before. So yeah. this had been a disastrous move. Uh, and the worry is that we repeat this uh, you know, the whole time and then give extra drugs to treat the problems. Like we're treating a patient who's got bipolar, uh, as you said, and uh, we give them an antipsychotic. And they come in a few weeks later and they say, well, I can't focus as well, which is exactly what we want an antipsychotic to do. We give them an ADHD rating scale. And of course, now because they can't focus, they have an ADHD. And we say, oh, you've got ADHD as well. We need to give you a stimulant, which is crazy. It's just not sensible. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, 
I mean, the, the other thread that I wanted to pull on from the cardiovascular research, which I think is really relevant to antidepressants and suicide is, you know, sometimes when you give these drugs, which are meant to lower your blood pressure or your heart rate, um, you know, some people will have the opposite effect as well. They can make people hypertensive, um, mm -hmm. which I think is, and I think that was easily recognized in the cardiovascular research that, hey, these drugs can have paradoxical effects. But when it comes to psychiatric medications, I, I feel like that was lost, you know, that, hey, you know, the antidepressants, they may make some people feel less suicidal, but they could actually, you know, if your genetics or whatever, you know, um, make you susceptible to it, you, you could get worse. Um, and I think that took a long time. And, you know, thanks to people like you, I think eventually, finally, in 2007, there was a boxed warning on antidepressants, but the concern really arose, you know, in like, 1990 you know something something like 16 years earlier which was interesting i'd, I'd like to segue now because I, I i really wanted to get your um uh i wanted to ask you about your experience actually treating some of these these severe problems that emerge um and maybe we'll start with pssd i know you have a, a very deep academic interest in the topic and i'm assuming that people have sought you out maybe in canada for help with the problem so I think that's the first question. I mean, maybe, I guess, since you've been talking about PSSD, how many patients have you directly, um, uh, I guess, treated or tried to treat or help through this, um, you know, in, in a clinical setting? Yeah, um, I've had contact with well over a thousand people. <clears throat> the problem, though, is I don't uh, try to treat them. Hmm. One of the worries is, People uh, are very keen to try a bunch of things. They'll try anything. They'll go on the internet and mm -hmm. see that there's a whole ton of things that you can try where people say, yes, this will help your uh, ability to make love. It'll reverse PSSD. There are people out there who uh, are scam artists. They claim to be experts on this. They claim to know what to do. They claim to be able to biohack you and get you back to where you were. And uh, this can't be done. At the moment, we don't know what the basis for post-SSRI sexual dysfunction is. And I mean, you don't have to know the basis in order to be able to treat a problem, but we don't have any good evidence that anything as such is a treatment that works uh, at the moment. Most people who have the problem figure it's in the brain because of course antidepressants work on mm -hmm. the brain my view from uh, at the very start has been that it's much more likely to be in the body than in the brain and of course the genital numbness that people uh, get within 30 minutes of the first pill that they go on uh, looks like it's happening too quickly in the genital area for it to be a thing that's happened because the pill has got into the brain and done all sorts of strange things there and uh, the message has come down to the brain to cause genitals to go numb. It's easier to think of this as been a thing that uh, that is happening locally down in the body, okay? Mm -hmm. But, you know, we don't even know that for sure. If you're asking me what's the kind of treatment that might make a difference, well, it, you know, it seems to be a treatment that is going to re-sensitize things. Uh, uh, treatment to reverse numbness. But we don't have many of these treatments. You know, uh, they are, are uh, so the ones that may do this aren't safe. So at the moment, I'm in the awkward kind of position of saying to people, look, I don't want to take your money off you for things that I can, uh, you know, for things that I can't do. There's no known cure at this point. There are people who recover naturally. It can be after months or years. Uh, it's probably the case that you don't want people to be doing too much to themselves in the intervening period. It, it seems to make sense that they're more likely to recover if they don't do too much, don't take too much. Uh, ultimately, though, hopefully we are going to have a treatment, and I'm hoping that it's going to be reasonably soon, partly because I've had increasing respect for the motivation of people who have problems like this. They go on the internet and some of them do crazy things, but most of them don't. Uh, they can, you know, they research what the options are. They 
research what to, what's actually going on. They get in touch with researchers who may be doing things that could be pertinent, you know, working on a bunch of proteins that look like they may be playing a part in uh, 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 mm. uh, uh, the whole thing. So I'm hopeful that in the next year or two, we're going to come up with some treatments that may actually be helpful. I'm hopeful that there's maybe some older drugs out there that do the kind of things that we would want them to do. But at this point, if people come to me, the unfortunate thing I have to say is, well, there's no known treatment at this point. Whatever you do, though, there's an increasing amount of research going on. You know, there is hope that we are going to make a breakthrough. So whatever you do, don't give up hope just yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I've, de I've definitely, um, um, you know, I have an interest in this. So I, I follow the the places online where people talk about PSSD. And I've seen everything from, you know, Buspa helped me, Wellbutrin helped me, uh, and then to name a whole range of different supplements. Um, I mean, I think I'm in some Facebook pages as well, you know, and you'll hear posts like, just started this new supplement, you know, and it's, and it's changed. And it's, it's completely improved things for me. And, you know, I don't want to diminish the people that try things like that and they have success over it, but by and large, I mean, it's, it's a crapshoot, you know, there, there are just as many people that try those things and they, and they don't work. Um, so I think, I mean, it seems reasonable to experiment with some things if you can do it safely, but there's always a risk and the long-term clinical course seems to be one towards improvement. So just, you know, you can just hang in there, even if you're not doing anything and, trust that your body will uh, continue to heal. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, moving, um, I wanted to ask you about uh, what you think about the name PSSD, because I've also noticed a lot of people talking about non-SSRI antidepressants causing the same problem. So I wanted to get your perspective on whether that's something that you've seen in your research. Yeah, there are for sure people who take other drugs and they can be... Uh drugs for ADHD are a whole range of other drugs uh, and claim that um, these cause PSSD. I think it's possible that, you know, we aren't all wired up the same way. And it is possible that there are people who are going to take non-SSRI drugs that can cause this kind of problem. But I think it's more likely what's actually happening is that other drugs cause sexual problems like bu propion can cause erectile dysfunction. Uh, atomoxetine can also. But that's not PSSD. To have PSSD, you've got to be genitally numb. So mm -hmm. absolutely for sure, other drugs can cause a range of pretty severe sexual problems, but it's not ordinarily PSSD. Okay, mm -hmm. so my hunch is, for the most part, uh, PSSD comes from SSRIs, although Here's the interesting thing about it, that finasteride for hair loss causes a picture that looks clinically identical to PSSD. And isotretinoin for acne does too. And there's a bunch of mm -hmm. antibiotics that are used for acne, like, like doxycycline, that can do the same thing as well. What's interesting about it, of course, is that it's not known, but that it's a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. One of the things that people don't realize is that there's a number of painkillers, a ton of antihistamines, some antibiotics and things like that, and isotretinoin that are serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So, you know, these drugs get labeled as antidepressants. They are antibiotics, but fluoxetine's an antibiotic as well as an antidepressant. Doxycycline is an antibiotic, but also will make you less anxious or make you suicidal just the way SSRIs do. So we end up in a world where we think we know what's going on because of the label that's on the drug. But we need to remember actually that all of these drugs do hundreds of different things. Each of them does hundreds of things. And if we're too focused on the thing we hope we're going to get, we may miss the problems uh, that the drug may also be causing. I think, yeah, I think that that that's a good point, and I like that you you brought up finasteride because it, what you know, that's a completely different mechanism of action. But when you look at it through that lens, that it has a similar clinical pit, uh, uh, very similar clinical presentation. It's like, sure, why not uh, PSSD type symptoms with Wellbutrin? You know, why not with mirtazapine? I mean, there is a lot 
mm-hmm. there is a lot that is unknown about the the way you know the the, the effects of these medications in the body. Um, I think it's a good time, uh, a, a, also a good time to kind of segue and talk about uh, a little bit about your experience treating, uh, I guess, what what is called protracted benzodiazepine withdrawal or post-acute withdrawal syndrome with antidepressants, which, at least from my perspective, tend to be really similar. You know, it's it's a very similar constellation of severe anxiety and um, neurological problems, which can range from burning to tinnitus to, you know, all this dizziness and balance problems. Um, and so I guess I wanted to talk to you about, um, you've probably been do- doing this for quite some time. Um, um, have you been, uh, have you had a lot of exposure uh, helping patients through this time? Because it's, it's something that I do a lot of, and I just wanted to know what your experience had been like shepherding these patients through what is sometimes the years it takes for them to recover yeah and um the um unfortunate thing about people with uh your dimensionization problems is that uh the world kind of left them behind there's a bunch of people in at the 1980s and 1990s who had been on benzodiazepines for ages and the industry bring out a new group of drugs the ssris and they just move on they don't try and tackle you know, the benzodiazepine problems. They leave patients there with all of the problems that they have. And as you say, um, benzodiazepine withdrawal problems are rather like SSRI problems uh, on withdrawal. My experience is that there's a group of people who can take benzodiazepines without having withdrawal problems, a group of people who take SSRIs without having withdrawal problems, but they aren't the same group. The ones who have no problems from benzodiazepines often have problems from the SSRIs and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, a little bit of the worry is that there's very severe problems with SSRI withdrawal, which people aren't actually facing up to at the moment. Uh, I mean, a large proportion mm-hmm. of the f- 15% of people in the, in the United States who are on antidepressants chronically now have to be people who are on them chronically because they can't get off them, okay? But the worry is that industry are going to bring out a new group of drugs and they're going to leave the people who've got problems on previous drugs just without help. They're just going to sort of say to family doctors, just, you know, you don't want to use those old SSRIs to which so many people get hooked. You want to use our new drug to which people can get hooked. And that's the way these things have gone, leaving a large number of people in their wake. And as you said, the I mean, we, we had a view that opioids uh, were you know, the classic drug to which people get hooked. And uh, there can be risks when you try to come off them. Uh, but in actual fact, opioid withdrawal is relatively time limited compared with Benzodiazepine are SSRI, yes. are antipsychotic withdrawal. And mm-hmm. with the opioids, there are drugs we can give you to intervene and make it much less painful. In the case of benzodiazepine withdrawal, if you've got a severe problem, we can ask you to taper. We can say it's a good idea to taper, but that may not solve the problem. But there's very little we can do to ease the problem. You know, there's not a num- you know, there isn't a bunch of other drugs that do a wonderful job in helping ease the pain of benzodiazepine or SSRI Mm -hmm. withdrawal. So these are much more serious problems than people recognize. We recognize opioid withdrawal as a major problem. There should be the same concern about withdrawal from uh, 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 the benzodiazepines, the GABA pentanoids, the antidepressants and the antipsychotics. You know, if not more, because um, like you said, I'm, opiate withdrawal is time limited. You know, I'm not familiar with the research, with any research talking about protracted problems coming off heroin or fentanyl or any of these things. But yeah, pe- people are devastated. Um, and I mean, just just to kind of bring a link together, I, I mean, I treat people right now um, who are in such severe withdrawal that you know they're they're almost anorexic. They've lost so much weight they're unable to eat. And you know we use pretty much anything we can to help them, right up to fentanyl patches, just so people can eat. Um, and um, it is really challenging to treat these folks. I mean, we try many different things. 
they often have severe paradoxical reactions to the medications that, you know, they take one dose and they feel substantially worse. And it's a really, it's, it's really challenging to navigate. I don't know if you've had those same experiences where you've just ended up just saying, I don't know what to do to help you other than, you know, just hang in there and wait a little longer. I mean, that's, yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, there's a movie, which I guess most of the people mm -hmm. watching this will have seen called the hurt locker. Mm -hmm. And you see this guy in a big suit to <laughs> try and keep him safe in the middle of a, a bunch of bombs and trying to work out what can be moved and what can't. And it's, very like that when you're dealing with people who are on a few of these drugs and finding it very, very difficult to get off them. You know, mm -hmm. the usual things you think about what the next drug you're going to add in might do often don't apply. This is terribly no. tricky. The problem needs to be recognized and we need to have a situation where people like you and me and other people who are trying to deal with these things have an opportunity to discuss options we've tried that have appeared to work, options that haven't worked and things like that, you know, but we don't have those forums now at the moment. If we, if we say, look, there are real serious issues here, we'll get accused of misinformation. Mm -hmm. at, at least, you know, and something I've been uh, grateful for, at least working in the space with the benzodiazepine problems is the, is the, is the updated FDA warnings. You know, I mean, that, I think that is, well, I won't say blown open, but it's it's given a lot of um, scientific backing to maybe professionals out there that want to treat this thing because it's no longer is it just something that's out there. I mean, it's it is mandated in the labels, you know, in the warnings and precautions um, uh, for all the benzodiazepines that protracted withdrawal, and it mentions all of the symptoms we discuss. You know, neurological problems like pain, paresthesia, severe uh, depression and anxiety. It's in there. It's it's a shame that we don't have something like that for antidepressants yet, because that would also give um, much needed mainstream credibility to the neurological devastation that some people find themselves in. There, I'm, I may ask you. I, I'm not familiar of any movement that is kind of petitioning health authorities on um, post-acute withdrawal syndrome for antidepressants. Uh, is, is that something that's that you've come across? In, you know, in the last couple of years. Um, yeah, uh, no, no, yeah. no. Um, it's been left to actually, uh, you know, to the patients to uh, devise their own uh, kind of approaches like tapering strips and things like that. And, and there's increasing interest in things like like tapering strips. But yeah, no, it's very much a case of people have been left to their own devices um, without mm -hmm. any recognition that uh, this could be... Uh, uh, a serious problem. Uh, it isn't in the interests of regulators, politicians, or the public to know that there are problems with pills. No one really wants to know about it. Um, not even doctors either. I mean, there may be a few who figure, well, look, it is good to look after people and things like that. But for the most part, doctors are in a situation of moral hazard. Like bankers during the financial crisis, we outsource risks, figuring that if things go wrong, well, it isn't us who's going to have a problem. It's going to be the patient that has the problem, or it's going to be the person who's taken out the mortgage. But I, the doctor, or the banker, will continue to collect my bonus at the end of the day. And once that's the case, we don't think about it too much more. Yeah, I mean, there's so many uh, pernicious things, and I mean, it may be the same in Canada, but but you certainly see it in the US um, where, um, you know, the visits, their 15 minute visits, you know, people come in to their family practice doctor, they spend 10 of those 15 minutes talking about their cardiovascular disease. And then, oh, the, oh by the way, you know, my, my spouse left me and I've been feeling really low, you know, and it's just right, right, right to a medication. And I mean, some of these things are, I mean, they're just they're, they're, they're symptoms of a health of a healthcare system, which is really just set up to uh, manage as many problems as you can in that 15 minute interval. And, you know, there's all this, you know, we have pharmaceutical reps, you know, we have guidelines which come in and they um, just, uh, you know, they, they make it very easy to say, oh, you've done the depression screening tool, you did the PHQ-9 
have you thought about trying an antidepressant? And it's just, I mean, you can't do good care in, you know, in the five minutes sure. that you have there. Yeah. No, I think it's the case that we don't manage the problems at all. Mm. We deliver services and we're mm. happy to give you more and more and more, um, yeah. you know. And increasingly, one of the things that's happening up here in Canada is that uh, we uh, are happily delivering more than any other country in the world at the moment, medical assistance in dying. And uh, elsewhere where this happens, one of the conditions that leads people to want to end their life is treatment-resistant depression. They've been on a bunch of drugs and nothing seems to be working and they feel awful uh, on these drugs and they opt for medical assistance in dying, which is... Um, which uh, I mean, it's I a problem a that we we may have put people in, you know, in, in yes. many oh, cases. Yes. Sure. Yeah, sure. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then they're told that. Well, you mentioned this, and I, I'm glad you brought that up because this is another thread. You say you get pulled into helping people on these cocktails of medications. How do you treat someone with antidepressant tachyphylaxis? You know, someone that's been on it for seven to eight years. They are severely lethargic. You know, blunted unmotivated they're maxed out on their antidepressant may also be on you know wellbutrin to augment that and an antipsychotic where do you even start un untangling this thing you know what, what's your experience yeah. helping these well, you people? can't yeah no you can't easily i mean i think the trick yeah. is trying to work back through the mix of drugs and find out mm -hmm. is the one that kick-started the issues and others have been used to treat the problems that it caused you know trying to identify things like prescribing cascades uh, mm -hmm. and if you can do that you can sometimes work back upstream slowly you know mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah it, it's it's uh, it's um it's not an easy job to do it is an interesting job because often you find from the patients themselves that they've done things which have helped mm -hmm. uh, so this is an area where They've got skin in the game and sort of do a lot of work themselves. And we can learn a lot from them as opposed to us knowing just what to do mm -hmm. for them. So. Yeah. Okay, David. Well, um, I think we've been, we've been, we've been talking for a good deal of time. So it might, might be a good time to wrap. Um, yeah. I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about uh, risk quickly and, um, and, and what you do over there. So, um, you know, for anyone that's not a, aware of that website, you know, that they can, um, you know, be aware of what, all the good work that you're doing over there. Yeah. Well, I think, Yosef, this, this would take a long time. And there's an interesting story. So perhaps yeah. it's one for us to come back to. But yes, okay. if people are on drugs and want to find out mm -hmm. a bit more about the drugs they're on, risk.org is a place to go and just root around and see what you find uh, okay. hopefully there'll be things there that will be helpful but there's an interesting story behind it and perhaps it's a thing we can pick up again in the future pick up on it another time david thank you so much for agreeing to do this and uh have a great day and uh okay. yeah thanks again take care Yosef. right thank you bye, bye.